Last year, Americans were surveyed and an astonishing 60% of Americans said they were unhappy either at work or at home or for many both. That means that of the people in this room and watching at home, over half right now likely are unhappy. Let's talk about the root cause of this problem. I believe it's our country's obsession with achievement and success. And for me, that all started when I was just five years old in first grade. I, I took a math test and I got a 99 and I was super excited. And I remember bringing it home to my dad, looking forward to sharing it with him. And he took one look at the test and he said, well, why didn't you get 100, Dave? And that was kind of a bummer. So I worked even harder. And two weeks later on my next math test in Ms. Flayton's first grade class, I got 100. This was my moment. Brought it home, showed it to dad, couldn't wait to hear dad's reaction. And this time, dad said, well, was there any extra credit? <laughs> you can laugh, it's OK. <laughs> Turned out there was, and I didn't get it. And that moment, and many others like it, drove me to always want more. And on the one hand, that served me very well in life. Did well in college, started building a business. One business wasn't enough, so I built a second business. Wrote a book. One book wasn't enough, so I wrote a second book, then a third. Had a kid. That wasn't enough, so I had a second and a third. But on the other hand, I was left always with this nagging sense of disconnection and unhappiness. The biggest moment I can think of that really uh, illustrated this was the day that my first book, Likeable Social Media, hit the New York Times bestseller list. I got the news from my agent and almost as if a power outside of my control was telling me this, there literally was not a moment that I appreciated hearing this and, and could be happy about it. Because the moment my agent said, you just hit the New York Times bestseller list, some power over me went into my head and said, Dave, you've got to run a New York City marathon. <laughs> and I literally, I called my wife and I said, Carrie, great news. I'm going to run the New York City Marathon. Oh, and I hit the New York Times bestseller list. It was totally bizarre. The moment I knew I had to change something was uh, when I realized my priorities were really out of whack. I had gone to a conference somewhat begrudgingly because it, was on a, it ended on a Saturday, and I really cherished that weekend time with my family. And I was flying home from Memphis. I had a connecting flight. And the first flight ran late, so, so I, I was in danger of missing the connecting flight. And I remember running in the airport to get that connecting flight to make it home to my family. And I got there just in time, or so I thought, because the gate had already closed. It had just closed. And as you all know, as soon as that gate closes, even if the plane is right there, there's nothing they can do. So I stood there for the next 15 minutes watching that plane, knowing that I couldn't get home to my family on time, and, and I just lost it, you know, tears streaming down my face. Well, I knew I had to change, but it's one thing to know you have to change, and it's another thing to actually operationalize it and actually make that change. Fortunately, some of the research for my second book was very, very helpful. I interviewed a couple hundred CEOs and world leaders for my second book, Likeable Business, and I realized one of the running threads was gratitude. Carrie Chesick, the former CEO of Restaurant.com, as it turns out, writes down five things he's thankful for every single morning. Sheldon Yellen, the CEO of a company called Belfour, writes thank you notes to his employees every day on their birthday. Now that's interesting, 
But it's even more interesting when I tell you that Belfour has 8,000 employees. So he writes an average of 17 cards every single day. Srikumar Rao, the famed Columbia business professor, talks about how the last thing he does before he goes to bed every night is think of five things and people that he's grateful for. And Sean Aker, happiness expert that I interviewed, does similar gratitude practices. So I decided my practice would be writing handwritten thank you cards. And I started out with writing just one. Because doing anything takes a lot of practice, and operationalizing anything is not easy. I started out with just one thank you card, and then I increased to one per week, and then one per day, and now I write three handwritten thank you cards every morning. I write them for my staff, my customers, my vendors, my family, my friends, the media. And there's two amazing things about writing handwritten thank you cards. The first is when people get them from a social media guy, they can't believe that somebody actually took the time in this digital age to actually handwrite a thank you card. And they really, truly appreciate it. And I have absolutely gotten business from writing handwritten thank you cards. But the second, even more powerful thing, and the thing that I truly didn't expect until I started doing it, was that as I write a thank you card each morning, as I'm writing those handwritten thank you cards, my mindset changes. It's unbelievable. You know, it's physiologically impossible to be angry or sad and grateful at the same time. So as I'm writing those thank you cards, even if they never get sent, my mood gets, cha gets changed. I can go from being in a bad mood to being in a good mood, being in a good mood to being in a great mood, being in a great mood to being ecstatic. It's like the best drug on the planet and it's totally free, and there are no bad side effects to handwritten thank you cards. <laughs> I want to close by giving you a couple more uh, principles that I really, really believe in for actual action steps to take principles of gratitude and scale them up, operationalize them, and really add happiness to your life. So one of the problems that we all have is that we're always on our phones. And you guys should be on your phones right now, tweeting and sharing and uh, sharing the love out there. But the downside to always being connected is that we're never connected to the people that matter most. So we started a practice in my family of putting our phones all away for an hour each day, just an hour, and actually connecting with each other face to face. We had a problem in my family as well, where every night we'd ask the kids how their day was at school, and they'd say, fine. fine. Did you learn anything today? Nothing. So instead, we added a new practice where every single day we all go around the dinner table and we each say one person that we're thankful for that day and our favorite moment of the day. And my kids totally fought me on it for a while. But now, we look forward to it every day. In fact, they argue, which is kind of funny and ironic, they argue over who gets to go first each night and share their gratitude. So I want to leave you with these three principles, writing thank you cards, disconnecting and shutting those phones off, and sharing who you're grateful for with others. And if you can operationalize this, as I did, I promise you, you too can absolutely achieve happiness at scale. Thank you very much.